Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are. I happen to be coming to you from Berlin today. This is Sharon Terry. I'm president and CEO of Genetic Alliance. Um, I'm using a wireless connection, so if I disappear, you will hear uh, Tanya Mirza from Genetic Alliance in Washington, D.C., uh, step in. We welcome all of you to our series, Managing the Massive Measure, Real People, Real Data Made Useful. Um, we're delighted today to have a, a webinar on Phoenix which will uh, certainly speak for itself and to our, our speakers. A couple of um, comments before I introduce our presenters today. Uh, as I said, this is a series, and so we're trying to bring to the community as many measures as we can over the series of several months. Our uh, series are always recorded, and the um, slides and the conversation and the questions are recorded. And all of that is sent out about a week after the, the webinar to all of you so that you can see them. Uh, you can also pass them on, and you can see prior uh, webinars as well. Last, month, last week, we had Pheno, uh, Phenome Central. So today, uh, we're going to hear from Carol Hamilton of RTI International. She's going to give us an overview and history of Phoenix. Then we'll hear from Kathy McCarty, who's from Essentia Institute of Rural Health, and also from Phoenix Rising, a project of Phoenix. And then Wayne Huggins from RTI International, who will do a toolkit demo for us of Phoenix. Um, I should also mention that I am on the Phoenix Advisory Board and very much excited and delighted to be part of this group doing really uh, cutting edge things that are very, very helpful to all of us. Uh, if you have questions, and we really hope you do, any question is a good question, we ask you to put them in the question box on your uh, go to webinar control panel. So you'll see that control panel. Uh, you can see a little arrow next to the word questions, and you can click it, and it has a place to type your questions. Feel free to type questions at any time throughout this webinar, because what I will do during the webinar is queue them up so that they are in some sort of logical order, and also so we're not having too much uh, duplicity or dupli duplication, I mean. Um, so without further ado, again, a reminder to those who just arrived, we are recording and we, the slides are available. All of that will be disseminated after the webinar. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Carol Hamilton. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sharon, and thanks very much for the invitation to uh, talk to this group about Phoenix. Okay. So, um, so Phoenix stands for um, Phenotypes and Exposures. Um, more formally, Consensus Measures for Phenotypes and Exposures. It um, was initially funded by the National Institute of Human Gen Genomics, NHGRI. Uh, the project scientist is Dr. Aaron Ramos. It is a cooperative agreement, so we work very um, closely with, um, with Dr. Ramos. Um, and initially, um, NHGRI, this was when, when this project was started, or when the genesis of this project was back in, say, 2006, 2005. Um, GWAS were just starting to, to gain traction and, and um, investigators were wanting to combine studies and found that their measures, they have very few measures in common. And so there were a number of uh, cross-NIH initiatives that, um, to, 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 uh, that came to the conclusion that standard measures were going to be important um, for genome-wide association studies. Um, so NHGRI put out an RFA and in September of 2007 RTI um, was awarded. Um, it's a, a U01 cooperative agreement, and this was to select and define high priority measures for GWAS, and also to uh, make them available, um, readily available to the public um, uh, via a, a Phoenix toolkit. Um, so the first was sort of phase one of, of Phoenix um, was that U01, and then um, recently we went in after a, a genomics resource, resource grant and were awarded a U41, um, which just started last summer. And there we're looking at, at maintenance, um, limited expansion, and also um, um, updating the toolkit. So that's where we are now. There's recognition um, now, uh, broad recognition. This, is, this has gone, the scope has gone beyond just genome-wide association studies. And certainly standard measures are relevant for a variety of different study designs. Um, they're important for validation. Uh, they're important for increasing statistical power. Uh, next slide. Are we supposed to have it? Yeah. Somebody have control of the slides on your side? Uh, you have control. Uh, sometimes you have to click oh, on the it. screen got it, got itself. It, got it, got it. Sorry. Okay. So I mentioned this is um, a multi-IC symposia um, 
and there was another one of Frontiers in Population Genomics, so 2006-2007, and again, rec um, recommendations, broad recommendations that um, you needed um, uh, standard phenotypes and exposures in order to um, get strong genetic associations for GWAS. The other thing is to still talk about GWAS, but I think um, one of the one of the very important aspects of GWAS where you really need um, larger sample sizes are looking for a moderate association, such as strong association, and more complex associations. And so this is gene-gene um, -gene interactions or, and gene-environment interactions. Okay, so the approach was, was um, different than what had been taken before. Many of the other measure initiatives were deep dives into, um, into relative, with relatively narrow scope. Here, the approach was to select 15 high-priority measures for each of 21 research domains. Um, this was also a very community-driven approach. Um, uh, Sharon already mentioned there's a Phoenix Steering Committee that they provide overarching guidance. Um, they scoped out the 21 um, domains. Um, each of those domains was addressed by a working group. Working groups are experts in the field, um, and they really were the people in the, the scientists in the trenches um, deciding what measures um, were suitable for inclusion in the toolkit. And then there's also an outreach component to the broader scientific community um, to provide, allowing them to review sort of preliminary lists of measures um, from the working groups um, to comment and make suggestions. Um, uh, measures are made available um, via the, the Phoenix Toolkit. And the idea here is that the toolkit is intended, okay, to make those measures available, but also to promote um, the use of standards and promote um, collaboration. Okay, so um, again, the, the, the concept of this being very community driven, um, in addition to the steering committee, we also have participation from most of the institutes and centers of the NIH. Um, and actually now in, with the genomic resource and some of the work that we're doing under that umbrella, we also have liaisons from the Department of Defense, from um, the CDC, and from the Veterans Administration. So now this is, has broadened beyond um, just NIH. Um, so just to kind of set the stage for the rest of the discussion today, what the toolkit is and what the toolkit is not. So it's a catalog of recommended measures for inclusion in new studies or when expanding existing studies. So the idea is that somebody, when they come to the toolkit, they already know, you know their, their, their key study questions. They have their, their measures that they need to address their scientific research question. They come to the toolkit to expand their study into areas where they would like to add a few measures, but it's not really their expertise, and they don't really know which the, what the best measures are. And here they, they can come to the toolkit and get measures that were, are likely to be used by others as well. Um, it is a database that allows to, researchers to browse, search, and select measures. Um, we do include some standards. We have is cross-reference to the um, to the CA Big Common Data Elements. We also have a LOINT code um, associated with the measures um, protocols and variables. So what the Phoenix Toolkit is not, it is not a new set of standards, per se. These are standard recommended measures in the, in the sense of wanting people to use common measures. It's not a new ontology of phenotypes. It's not a data repository. This is only, this is, these are only measures. You come to the toolkit, you take them away with you, you put them into your study, and you collect your data however you're going to collect your data. So we don't, we don't deal with data collection, per se. We just try to make it easy for investigators to integrate Phoenix measures into their, into their study design. Not a biobank. It's not restrictive. Just because there's Phoenix measures doesn't mean you, we expect anyone to use all of them. If there's a Phoenix measure you don't like it very much, don't, don't use it. We're hoping that there's a, a variety, you know, a, a wide enough range of measures um, in the toolkit that there would be some that would be um, hopefully um, and complementary to um, any any study that any study design. It's also not proprietary. Proprietary. It is um, it is available for use at no cost. Um, full disclosure: there are a few protocols in the toolkit that are proprietary. In which case, we send you to the source um, for you to get them. But um, there's not really very many of those, and we we try to um, avoid that. Um, so this is just the the toolkit homepage. Um, there's I'm not going to go through it. You're going to see more about this um, from the other speakers. But there are some, there are some helpful um, things to get started. There's a quick start guide. There's a tutorial. I've talked about um, sort of um, 
broad and shallow. There's 21 domains and 15 measures per. And actually, you can see at the bottom of the slide um, the top five measures, um, which not surprising, and top five domains. You can get a, an idea even of the range of the domains just from their dem demographics, anthropometrics, and so on. Um, I would like to point out the little um, green triangle at the left side of the screen. Um, what that is is that's um, uh, seven new collections of measures um, in support of substance abuse and addiction. I'm only pointing this out because what's conceptually what's important about it is that NIDA looked at the toolkit and they said, okay, this is great, we like what you have here, but we want to provide, um, we want to provide for our, our, you know, better for our own substance abuse and addiction researchers. And so they actually uh, funded a small project to, um, to provide depth in the area of substance abuse and addiction. And this has caught on, in a sense. Um, we have a, a, a couple of more of these types of projects that are underway now. One is for, um, for mental health research, and another is for tobacco regulatory research. With that, I'll turn it over to Kathy. Great. Um, thanks for the introduction, uh, Sharon. So I'm one of the users of the Phoenix Toolkit. And Carol's slide that showed the little icons on the left with the uh, green triangle, the one below that was for Phoenix Rising, which is what I'm going to talk to you a bit about this morning, yes, yeah, so, uh, Phoenix Rising. So our first meeting of the Phoenix Rising group, of course, we had to come up with an acronym. So Rising is uh, real word implementation and sharing. So why use standard measures? As a scientist, and Carol mentions that really the toolkit is primarily for non-experts, because if you're an expert in the area, you already have your tools. You're, you may have helped develop them, but you're certainly aware of them. So I think particularly useful for large epidemiologic studies where you might want to look at other exposures and outcomes, but one's not quite so familiar to you. What are some well-accepted standardized tools that you could use, and then you'd have comparative data? So where you're needing validation, fantastic to use standardized tools because you're going to be collecting information that will allow you to compare uh, with other data that are out there. Obviously increasing sample size. I'm also a principal investigator in the eMERGE network funded by National Human Genome Research Institute. And that initial RFA, people were supposed to propose at the different sites outcomes for say 1,500 cases, 1,500 controls, and we quite quickly found that that wasn't anywhere near enough power for us for discovery. And so where we could standardize uh, both the genotypes and the phenotypes as much as possible across the eMERGE sites, that allowed us then to uh, compare our data and then combine for meta-analyses. So you, for GWAS especially, and sequencing now as well, you do need those larger sample sizes and just uh, more robust statistical analyses where you're, you're using the same measures. Next slide, please. So the Phoenix definitions and the way they're set out, you have domains, measures, and protocols. And it, uh, Wayne will show you this and, and walk you through this. And, and fantastic to use. So as an investigator, the first time I went on, very intuitive, uh, the website. So at the level of a domain, you have a topical area with a unifying theme. So as an example, uh, the alcohol, tobacco, and other substances. And then within that domain, when you would click on the domain, you get into the measures. Certain characteristics are related. Um, one of the measures that I've used now in a couple of studies is the 30-day quantity and frequency protocol for alcohol. And then the specific protocols. And when you go into the specific protocols, you'll find the actual questions and uh, how they're used, how they're meant to be used. If, for instance, if they're supposed to be interview administered, if they've been validated for self-administration, or now with Phoenix Rising, if they might have been validated for use in a, in a web setting. Next slide, please. So environmental exposures. You'll guess from looking at these different domains that, in fact, there is some overlap within the domains. And you'll find, for instance, that uh, environmental exposure that increases risk of uh, cancer also increases risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, smoking being an example that uh, might be a cross-cutting exposure. Next slide, please. 
So the criteria for selecting the Phoenix measures, and Carol mentioned the, their new uh, grant, and as the group is being reformed and thinking about Phoenix measures and developing new measures, we're going back to revisit these same criteria. So the measures when we're selecting a new one or looking at old ones when we're revisiting the, some of the measures already available in the toolkit, obviously they need to be clearly defined well-established, uh, broadly applicable to different study settings and different uh, potential study samples. Obviously, they need to be validated, reproducible, specific and reliable. Standard measurement protocols exist, and where possible, that they be in the public domain. And that has had been an issue for some of the Phoenix measures where they're proprietary and you had to pay for their use. That is indicated if that's the case where there might not be something that would meet these other criteria freely available in the public domain. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Um, how I've used the toolkit as an investigator. So I uh, moved to Essential Institute of Rural Health in Duluth, Minnesota uh, three years ago, and we wanted to conduct a study looking at um, some psychosocial measures, use of health care, how often someone takes a vacation. And I had some of the tools already available because we'd used them uh, previously. And then we wanted to pick some additional measures, specifically something related to dietary intake that wasn't going to be too onerous either. And so we went to the toolkit to see what was available, and then uh, pulled those measures out to create a, a self-administered survey in this case. So great when you're planning new studies. Um, when you're selecting those measures, or preparing a study, you want to try and select Phoenix measures where possible, especially if you're thinking about comparing with other studies. And a number of institutes now, as they're putting out RFAs, are requesting, not necessarily requiring, but requiring, but requesting that investigators use Phoenix measures where possible. Certainly where I'm part of multi-center studies and we're developing a new questionnaire, unless they have a validated tool already, to think about what might be available in the Phoenix Toolkit. Next slide, please. So the way this worked in Phoenix Rising, and where it has worked, because we're talking about this in the Emerge Network too, thinking about if uh, we're what we call Emerge 2, the second round of funding on that RFA, and uh, thinking about the possibility of Emerge 3, and one of our discussions has been, could we add Phoenix measures to more of the sites so that we could do some more gene environment type analyses with our existing GWAS data? Within the Phoenix Rising Network, we all had different uh, phenotypic outcomes of interest, but then added additional Phoenix measures where possible to allow us to compare across sites. And as an example, uh, we at Essentia and Marshfield Clinic in Marshfield, Wisconsin, where the biobank exists, and we've gotten the additional Phoenix measures for phenotypic data, added some measures so that uh, measures for depression so that we could combine our data, both the genotypic and phenotypic data that were available with University of Michigan. And that's been a, a fruitful collaboration. So you have these individual studies looking at different outcomes such as cardiovascular disease or uh, diabetes at our site. Our primary outcome had been cataract and low HDL. And then adding Phoenix measures from the toolkit that might be relevant to our own outcomes, maybe distantly, um, but allow us then to combine across the study results. We also developed within both eMERGE and Phoenix Rising a very short uh, data use and data sharing agreement. And that is available on the Phoenix Toolkit. If you go to Phoenix Rising, that is available there as well. So that rather than going to dbGaP, because the sites that were funded as part of the agreement have uh, deposited their data into dbGaP so that investigators where they want to can search, in fact, dbGaP, not just for genotypes that they might be interested in, but they can search for Phoenix measures that are specifically identi identified by the Phoenix ID. 
rather than going through that process, within the network of Emerge and within the, within the network of Phoenix Rising, we developed the state use agreement. Very simple, two pages, amazing, got it through all of our legal, agree all of our legal departments uh, to allow us to com uh, combine our data and then have this increased sample size and statistical power for, for discovery, which we are finding we're able to do uh, discovery even with, uh, in the Emerge network, using electronic health records for the um, medical outcomes of interest. All right, next slide. Uh, so it was funded by NHGRI existing uh, NIH studies. That ended up being a bit of a challenge for us just because the parent grants had different funding cycles, as did the supplements. So we met in person once and would have monthly phone calls, but just yeah, different dif different time frame. But we've continued to collaborate across the Phoenix Rising network. Again, seven ongoing studies, multiple outcomes, and the Phoenix Toolkit. The RTI was just wonderful, very responsive. As the Phoenix Rising group was the first, you know, large network to use the Phoenix Toolkit we would have suggestions as we came across things, and they were very quick to implement those suggestions and improve the toolkit, and we're always looking across the scientific community for input from users uh, to make ongoing improvements to the toolkit. Next slide, please. So this shows the seven sites that were funded, uh, their study names and the number of measures that they were looking at. Uh, D.K. Garrett. Uh, University of Oklahoma was the one site looking at the bioassays, and that uh, that was interesting, and she had some really good feedback from that. Two of the sites had web-based implementation and good feedback on that as well. At our site, Essential and Marshfield Clinic of Wisconsin, ours was self-administered, so taking the the existing protocols within the toolkit and making them, because a number of them were had been an interview administered, and changing the directions and uh, the formatting to make it self-administered. Next slide. Oh, and from that last one, I forgot to mention that there was, um, we do have an investigator from um, China, and he had translated the uh, toolkit into uh, Mandarin. So Phoenix Rising, the seven groups added a total of 76 measures to their existing studies. And a no, for a number of them, we had the same measures across all studies. And we also went through a process of trying to link existing data from the studies that may, in fact, may have been identical because we're using common protocols that available, validated, and that's why they were included in the Phoenix Toolkit, or they were similar enough that we could map them to, to the toolkit. And then they are so labeled in dbGaP when we do our submissions to dbGaP. The whole broad range of, of measures that were included, all, I think all of us had some uh, similar demographic measures. And then, as noted, that last point, 55 of the 76 measures were shared by two or more groups and, and really have been quite fertile for uh, cross-study analyses, se several of which are continuing, even though the uh, supplements have now finished. Next slide. So uh, we'll be moving into Wayne now to take you actually through that toolkit and how to use it. OK, thanks, Kathy. Uh, so I'll be giving you a brief demonstration of the toolkit. Uh, first, just want to give you some of our use statistics. Uh, so that we um, we launched the toolkit in early 2009, uh, and the time since we've gotten to about 1,400 registered users. Uh, users in 155 countries have accessed the toolkit. We've had about half a million visits, and of those, 5,825 have been unique. We're up to about 286 visits per day, per day, and we've had 3,872 uh, reports downloaded. Um, this shows the websites, the um, actual addresses. So I'll be showing you the phoenixtoolkit.org website. That's where the measures are. We also maintain a portal, which is phoenix.org. 
Uh, this provides general information about the Phoenix Project, and you can register there to receive periodic updates. Uh, there's also, of course, the genome catalog, the GWAS catalog, uh, which is maintained by MHGRI on uh, genome.gov. Uh, so let's go to the Phoenix Toolkit. Um, this is the home page. I'm just going to briefly show you how to find measures and then add them to uh, my toolkit. Uh, so you can browse or search for measures. Uh, browse is on the nav bar at the very top. You can browse by domain, so I'll show you that. Screen bear. Yeah, control, control plus. I can't read it. So um, we've got 21 Phoenix domains. They're, they're listed here uh, alphabetically. Number of measures in each domain is in parentheses. Um, I'll just show you an example from the diabetes domain. Uh, so you can drill down into, that, into domains by clicking on the domain name. Uh, this takes you to the domain page where the, the measures are again listed alphabetically. Um, uh, then you get to the protocol, you can uh, click on the, the measure name. So when we do that, we come to the measure page. I um, want to point out that the toolkit does include more than just the actual protocol, so there's actually a lot of metadata that's been curated about the measure and protocol by the working groups. Um, so for example, there's a definition of the measure and a purpose of the measure. Uh, the protocols associated are shown here in this box. Uh, there's just one protocol with this uh, autoimmune diseases related type 1 diabetes. Uh, but some measures do have um, contextually linked protocols for like adults, one protocol for adults and one for adolescents, for example. Uh, to actually view the protocol, um, click on the protocol name. Um, collapse these. So, there are a number of fields with metadata. So, for example, there's a description of the protocol. Uh, there can be specific instructions from the working group for collecting the protocol. Uh, selection rationale are the reasons why working groups chose this protocol for the domain. Uh, the protocol itself is under the protocol text tab. Uh, this is a relatively simple protocol. It's just a one question. It's just one question. Uh, do you or your child have any of the following diseases? Uh, for example, multiple sclerosis, Addison's disease, or psoriasis. Um, let's see, just scroll down here. And so once you review all the information, uh, there's a button at the very bottom of the protocol page where you can add this directly to my toolkit. And so if we do this, uh, this takes us to my, tool, to my toolkit page. Uh, this is a card-like structure that stores all the measures you're interested in. Uh, so, for example, we just added autoimmune diseases related to type 1 diabetes into my toolkit. Um, just want to point out we've got a couple of flags here. Uh, so, there are two flags under essential measures, and you can hover over this to see uh, more information. Essentially, essential measures are other measures in the Phoenix toolkit that the working group recommends you also collect in order to correctly interpret the measures in your cart. Uh, so for this measure, it's recommended we include current age and gender. Uh, you can add these directly from my toolkit by clicking on these boxes. If you're interested in looking at the measures, you can also click the name and it'll, it'll take you to the measure page. I'm going to go ahead and add these. Um, and you can see when I click that, we have a nice green check mark there. I'll go ahead and add gender. Uh, we've got the flags taken care of. You can see the current age and gender are now also in my toolkit. I um, also want to point out a neat feature we've got here, which is um, designed to help you find other measures you may be interested in. This is an Amazon.com-like feature. So other measures, other users who chose this measure also chose these measures. So for example, other users who chose current age and gender also chose ethnicity, current educational attainment, and race. And again, you can uh, view those by clicking on the measure name, or you can add those directly to your toolkit. Uh, using these buttons. Uh, so the other way of finding measures is using the search feature. Um, so if you know exactly what you want to find, browse is a good way to start. But we do want to point out that um, measures related to a particular concept can be spread across across multiple domains. 
So, for example, the diabetes measures are up there in the diabetes domain, but there may be other measures of interest in nutrition and dietary supplements as well as anthropometrics. And so this is where search is really helpful. Uh, we have some filters across the top, and you can see those by clicking on any of these names. We've got filters for data collection mode, uh, for life stage, uh, the length of time it takes to complete the protocol, as well as the language the protocol is available in. Um, we've got two types of searches. We have a smart search and a text search. Text search. Uh, the smart search is our high specificity search. It uses uh, names, aliases, and keywords. Uh, in contrast, the text search is a high sensitivity search. It looks for the occurrences. It looks for occurrences of your search terms and the metadata associated with the measures and protocols. I'll show you an example of this. So since we looked at diabetes, I'll show diabetes again. And we'll do a smart search. And so you can see that we've got 29 search results and terms and synonyms for diabetes. Uh, let's see. You can scroll down so if I can get rid of this. So on the so on the far left is the measure name, followed by the definition of the measure, and then the domain it comes from. And so if we just briefly scroll through these, we can see the first 15 come from a diabetes domain, but then there are measures in anthropometrics, for example, like body image and body composition. And then we've got sugar intake uh, from nutrition and dietary supplements. Uh, you can add measures directly to my toolkit from the search results. Uh, so, for example, let's scroll back down. Um, I'm going to pick up. Uh, so, for example, if you can review the measure by clicking on the measure name, you can also add them directly to my toolkit. Um, so, by checking this box and then scrolling down to the bottom, uh, add selected measures to my toolkit. So, I'm going to add the oral glucose tolerance test. And I want, the reason I want to do that is I just want to show you the other flag in the toolkit, which is the requirements. So when we added the oral glucose tolerance test, we now have an exclamation point uh, under the requirements field. And if we hover over the question mark, you can see that we must review the special requirements for all measures with the exclamation point. Uh, this is an indication of burden. Uh, so if we click on the exclamation point, it'll take us to the requirements category for the oral glucose tolerance test. And so we measure burden according to four uh, requirements. Uh, does the measure take longer than 15 minutes to collect? Uh, does it require a piece of major equipment? Um, are there specialized requirements for biospecimen collection? And does it require specialized training? Uh, the oral glucose tolerance test, for example, will require longer than 15 minutes. Um, you've got some options here, so you can accept and keep in your toolkit or you can remove from my toolkit or you can decide later. I'm just going to go ahead and accept that. And so just to show you that now we've got a nice green check mark for all the measures in my toolkit. Uh, so once you've found the measures you're interested in, you've got three options. You can download a report. And the report is a document that lists all of the metadata associated with the measures and protocols in my toolkit. If you're just interested in the protocols themselves, we have what we call a data collection worksheet, or DCW. Um, and this allows you to create custom uh, DCWs based on the uh, measures in your cart. So for example, if you're only interested in the questionnaires, you can select self-administered and interview-administered questionnaires. And then you can download the DCW in Word format. And I'll show you what that looks like. It's uh, useful for um, adding the measures, adding the protocols into your study documents. So, um, this is the data collection worksheet for those measures. Uh, you can see that the first measure is autoimmune diseases related to type 1 diabetes. Um, you scroll down, uh, here's current age. And then we've got gender. Uh, from the from this page, you can also generate custom data dictionaries. Um, just want to point out that the data dictionaries in CSV format are compatible with DBGAP submission. And briefly, just want to show you um, to wrap up uh, 
register my studies. Yeah, you can show it real quick. Let me log in. Yeah, so here, once you log in, you can see all the registered studies. Uh, so the registered, uh, your register your study feature helps registered users find other studies that are using the same Phoenix protocols in order to identify opportunities for cross-study analysis. Again, this is based on the Phoenix Rising project. Uh, there are two ways to look at this. Uh, this is the study view, so it lists the study name, principal investigator, uh, research focus, and primary contact. Uh, you can also see the measures in common across all registered studies uh, using this link. And what this will show you is for all the registered studies, which measures, which protocols and measures they have in common. So for example, you can see here uh, the current age is included by all of the studies that have a yes underneath them. Uh, and I think that's it for the demo. Um, just finish up with some acknowledgments. Uh, so, of course, NHGRI, the project scientist Aaron Ramos, uh, Terry Manolio, um, Phoenix, Phoenix Steering Committee, uh, Mary Mary Zita and Kathy McCarty are our co-chairs, um, working group chairs and members, of course. Um, we have uh, liaisons to each of the NIH institutes and centers. Uh, Kevin Conway was a project scientist for the the NIDA Administrative Supplement. Uh, Kay Wonky is the scientist for the TRIS Supplement, and Greg Farber is the project scientist from NIM for that Administrative Supplement. Uh, and then, of course, all the members of the RTI team. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks to all three of you. That was really excellent. Uh, we have a number of questions, and as I mentioned in the beginning, you all should feel free to type questions into the portal that uh, is your GoToWebinar control panel. You may have to click the little arrow in order to see the, the box to type the questions in. And I will uh, be asking the presenters questions uh, up until the top of the hour. Um, so get your questions in, and we'll make sure that they are asked. And if we can't fit them all, then uh, we usually just ask the presenters to answer them later in email for you. So first question. Um, can and how uh, Phoenix can be helpful in building a database from electronic medical records. That is interesting. Kathy, you want to take that, or do you want me to take it? Um, so I have two thoughts on that. One is, of course, it's, um, unfortunately it's not a database, other than we ask people if they're making submissions to dbGaP that they do link it back and would use any of the Phoenix identifiers. So the Emerge Network is all about the electronic health record data. And we've had a couple of discussions between Emerge and Phoenix, and I think there's certainly more opportunity to do that. Within the Emerge Network, uh, and the website for that is www.gwas.net, we make freely available through that network all of the algorithms that have been developed and validated across the network for the phenotypes. And by the end of Emerge 2, we should have at least 40 of them. Um, but we've not had any formal discussions about linking that more formally with uh, Phoenix. And I think there is the potential to do that. What do you think, Carol? Yeah, so we were, we were just thinking about you know what we've done with with variables that are in dbGaP, where you we we can map and we can say it's identical to to Phoenix measure if it was prospective or it's comparable or related, and it seems like I mean I don't quite know where this is going, but if you were um, extracting information from electronic health records and there was a way to um, map the variables um, in the health records to Phoenix measures, even if it's you know comparable or related. Um, it's treated sort of like legacy data, then it might give you um, hooks into um, from that from that collection of, of data into other research studies and into um, uh, studies in dbGaP. Great, thanks very much. Uh, next question: It seems like some of the measures might depend on self-reporting. Please discuss how that might confound re results. 
So that really is something that this, <clears throat> these measures are, are selected by the working groups, and and um, there's a lot of a lot of discussion. There's been a lot of discussion about self-report and when self-report is is sufficiently accurate or not. Um, and so, for example, even with height and weight, where the working group, you know, strongly agreed that measured height and weight was was the way to go, they did actually put self-report height and weight in the toolkit because they felt that that was better than nothing if that's the only thing you could get. So it, it really, when it comes down to implementation of the measures that are in the Phoenix toolkit, it really is up to the individual investigator and, you know, and the purpose of their study to make those decisions about whether or not the mode of administration is, is going to be appropriate for the type of information they want to collect. We do have references and you know, there's, there's substantiation from the working group and references, and so you can go in and, and check the, the validation type work, um, but it, you know, it, it is a, a known concern. Great. And uh, I think um, also if people go ahead and play with looking at the various domains and the measures within the domains, they'll see that you actually cover, as Wayne showed, a wide swath of kinds of measures. So in other words, some are actual physical in the doctor's office measures, and others are uh, ones that I think, like the last questioner asked, could be garnered from the medical record itself, and then others are self-report. OK, um, next question. Is Phoenix a tool useful in planning data collection? Um, and second part of the question, for existing data, how are we going to standardize the phenotype and increase sample size? So <laughs> I'm, I'm loving these questions because they are complicated beyond the Phoenix tool itself, but Phoenix is a, a, an integral part of this system. So first part of the question, is Phoenix a tool useful in planning data collection? Well, I don't know about that. I think so. I mean, you think so? Okay, Kathy, you can take it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so yeah, as, as, you know, as the scientists out there, when we've been planning studies, we we and thinking about grants, we look to the toolkit to see what's available for data collection. And yeah, do I think, think about, I, and do I, think about in the mode of administration as well, and and how we're planning to reach our study population. I, I guess I was interpreting it as actual help in, in the data collection part of the, of the study, which, you know, we, we don't really play in that space, except to, except to help you integrate um, Phoenix measures into your study design. Um, although there's, we're, we're sort of dancing at the, at the doorstep, though, because the, it's recently um, been decided by the, by the steering committee that we should go ahead and, and get at least most of Phoenix measures, if not all of them, integrated into REDCap. And now REDCap, now you, now you are, um, uh, it does support data collection. Right. I think um, from my point of view, and this will be helpful, I think, to some of the advocacy organizations on the phone, as we look at, for example, what we will be doing in PCORnet in the projects there, it's certainly very helpful, and it's part of why I wanted this webinar to be early in our series. Uh, for us to look at those measures to help us to determine how to collect data. Uh, and then even I've found as I look through them, I'm uh, aware then of other things I should be collecting because I haven't thought about things as completely as I can. And the expert uh, working groups certainly have thought about it in a much more comprehensive way than I possibly can. Yeah, certainly the, uh, we've got a lot of um, good feedback on the essential measures. Um, really making it easier for people to make sure they, they collect everything they need. And I think in the spirit of data collection, the one thing that is that Phoenix does very well is it's very protocol centric. That is, if you haven't collected the data using, you know, using the same method, um, then your data isn't truly comparable. Wonderful. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm a little delayed here because I'm muting and unmuting myself. Um, okay, next um, question is, is there a standardization of patient recruitment and informed consent that's part of Phoenix? Not part of Phoenix. I know there was um, Aaron Ramos at NHGRI was involved in a a project to 
standardize consents, um, streamline and standardize consents. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the details right now. Kathy, do you I, know them? Yeah, I, so that came out of Emerge as well. And I have to say, you know, this is, this is advancing so quickly that some of that language is out of date as well. But it's on the NHGRI, we, NHGRI website. So it was specific uh, to biobanking and some general language around a general biobank. And there is a model consent form on the, both the Emerge and the NHGRI websites for that. But as I said, some of it's out of date because this is just moving so rapidly. The language in the model consent, for instance, uh, specifically states not sharing any results back with study participants and our, our thinking around that in the scientific community is certainly changing. Right. Uh, that was also a big discussion here. I'm in Berlin at the International Rare Disease Research Consortium Steering Committee meeting and part of what uh, Kim Boycott uh, this committee reported is uh, a desire to sort of revisit that, plus uh, NCATS has done some of that. There's several other entities in Europe that have done essentially informed consent, consent elements that could be drag and drop or, um, you know, useful in some, some different context. Um, so I think there will be an effort uh, between that, PCORI, the Global Alliance for Genomes and Health, uh, all seem to be gravitating toward getting that updated and also uh, building on the resources that are already there. Next question. Um, how do you pull in other researchers uh, to increase power? Uh, can you give an example? Um, Sorry, I had to give well, yeah, Kathy, go ahead. So it was easy for us with Phoenix Rising because <laughs> we were all funded to do this. But uh, certainly one way to do this is the more that people start using dbGaP as a way to uh, link their measures to uh, Phoenix, you can certainly contact people that way. Otherwise, it's you know, sort of the old informal scientific network of going to meetings. Well, and we also, that, this was the purpose of the register your study tool. So, you know, in well, order, in, go ahead. Yeah, so hopefully we'll see more of that. And the thing with dbGaP is, and um, we didn't talk about this very much, but we, we did map Phoenix to a number of studies um, that are existing in dbGaP, in other words, legacy data. And there is a plan to, to map to all the studies in dbGaP. And there's a kind of a, a prototype search tool in there that, that could use a little bit of tuning, but we'll, we'll work on that once we, we get there. But the idea being that you'd be able to search all of, of dbGaP, and if you searched for a keyword and, and, you, and you found measures in a variety of different studies, then you'd be able to identify which Phoenix measures were in that study and whether they were comparable, identical, comparable, or related. Um, so that's what, that's what Kathy's getting at, and I think that will be a very powerful resource. It's not... There are Phoenix measures in there that are identified that way, but it's not, not all studies have been, have been mapped. Um, the other thing with, with dbGaP is, frankly, you have to wait until, until all of the, um, the data has been collected and submitted to dbGaP. And the, the hope was with the Register Your Study tool is that if people would share, you know, when they're, after their studies are funded, um, what Phoenix measures they're using and what the purpose of their study is and what their population looks like, that this would be a resource for people to, to look at, perhaps even when they're doing grant proposals, and also certainly for, for um, thinking about um, pre-planning cross-study analysis. Um, so, but it's hard to get, um, I mean, we have like 15 studies registered. It's, um, it's, we try to make it really easy for people to register their study, but whether or not that will really catch on, um, you know, with 1,400 registered users, we're, we're thinking that more than 15 studies are using our measures. So how do we how do we get people to, to share that information and, and um, so that the, the broader so the scientific community can really benefit from from that information? Right, and I think the other kind of good way to disseminate um, the idea of using Phoenix tools certainly is this uh, uh, intended integration with RedCap with a hundred thousand researchers using RedCap, and if there could be some easy way, again, uh, directly tied to REDCap to indicate I have used the Phoenix measure in my REDCap survey or REDCap project, then 
it will be easy to have that fed back to uh, to Phoenix Actually, and to see those numbers rise. That's a great suggestion, Sharon. Only when I got to remember that when we talk to Red Cap, when we when we really get this rolling, um, to figure out how to capture that because we could, you know, either feed it into the register study tool or some other sort of two way street there, so that um, we can inform each other of what studies are using um, Phoenix measures from each of those different resources. Yep. Yes. And a related question then, um, the questioner asks, I understand that some of the measures within Phoenix are intended for patient self-reporting. Are any of the promise met program measures included in the Phoenix space? And if so, are they cross-referenced so that we know they are a promise measure? And I'll add to that, and it was just announced that Promise, Vanderbilt's uh, PCORnet group, has actually put all of the promise measures into REDCap as a um, uh, as a as a tool set, so can you comment on the relationship essentially between Promise and Phoenix and overlap? So the the we're, we we are very well aware of Promise and, and looking to interact with them more. There there are some Promise measures in the toolkit and um, they're cited in the in the metadata as as being you know from Promise. Um, the the reason there are more is that frankly these two um, projects were were coming of age at the same time, and so although there was a lot of interest, the promise measures were, in, most of them were in the process of being validated. So they didn't meet the criteria for broad validation for inclusion. Um, later in the, uh, so some of the later of the 21 domains, there were actually some promise measures that made it into the toolkit. Um, we think that this is going to be a, um, an important aspect um, for the, the 21 domains. Um, that are now coming up for rolling review, um, where expert review panels are going to look what's in there and see um, if there needs to be updating or additions made um, to the toolkit. Um, but aside from citing Promise, I don't think we actually link to Promise, but we, we say where it came from. So, but we have also talked about, um, with not only with Promise, but with some other, um, so for example, um, you know, even even NeuroCall or NINDS, where um, if you can't find it, in, in other words, if it's not going to be in the toolkit, so, so there's, there are promise measures that are in the toolkit and there's promise measures that aren't. And so if you can't find it in the toolkit, how do we most effectively um, send people to another site that will give them um, the in-depth measures that they're looking for? So we recognize that that would be a nice feature. We're not, we're not quite sure how we're going to do that yet. Great. So a question that followed on that one is, what is Promise? Um, so um, I'll ask you to briefly explain Promise, and I know that that's a bit out of your domain, and I'll also mention that on June 24th we will be having a Promise webinar, and for people who want the link, I'll put it in the answer block, but it's a simple URL. It's uh, www.nihpromise, with no E on the end, because it's also an acronym, which means dynamic tools to measure health outcomes from the patient perspective. Um, but uh, would you mind, um, Carol, just saying uh, what PROMISE is? I can try. Patient reported outcomes. outcomes. Yeah, so they're, they're patient report measures for clinical, for use in clinical trials. Uh, NeuroCall is for use in, is the same concept for use in neuro, neurological clinical trials. I think that the, the claim, the, the, the key Part here, and again, you know, you're right. We are not experts in this, but it's item. It's based on item response theory, so IRT. And so, as I understand it, there you have a library of items, and then different researchers will pick and choose among the items. And and so it has the advantage is it has a lot of flexibility, and 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 it can kind of adapt over time. Um, when it's come up, when there's been discussions of using um, these type of measures for Phoenix. It's a little bit tricky because unless you limit sort of the items in the library, you risk having measures that really don't have much in common. But um, but I I not but that's that's just um, very 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 high level um, description. But I think they um, promise has come a long way. There's a lot of measures now that are broadly validated, and people are very interested in them. And uh, and it's a it's a very interesting approach. Super, and we are at the top of the hour, so um, I'm going to um, answer quickly two other questions that just came in, and, and then Carol, you should feel free to add to my answer if it's too general. Uh, but the person, uh, both questions from the same person is asking, 
uh, are the tools all rather generic and could you give more examples of environmental exposures besides uh, tobacco and alcohol? Um, so my quick answer would be that there are generic tools and there are very in-depth tools, since it, as this person asks uh, phenotype, it, it needs specificity. And then uh, could you give a couple other examples uh, besides, environmental, uh, besides alcohol and tobacco for the environmental exposures? Sure. I think um, skin bone muscle joint um, has a UV irradiation one. Um, environmental exposures itself, I think, has, I can't remember if they called it dust bag or vacuum bag, which is, um, you know, the analysis of the contents of the vacuum cleaner. Um, there's um, water source, which is a, a, a water quality um, um, measure. Um, this, another one from, a couple others from environmental exposures are plastics exposures at work and at home. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of ones that are not, that are outside of environmental exposures. Um, cancer, cancer focused on risk factors, so I think they also have some exposures. Yeah, pull up, open up cancer. Yeah, so they have passive solar exposure, um, medication use um, as an exposure. Oh, and also, depending on how broadly you consider exposures, but um, certainly um, the uh, nutrition and dietary supplements as exposures, you know, your, your diet and supplements. Um, and, um, and, and more broadly, there's a whole um, domain of social environment, which um, is recognized now as a, as a type of exposure. Super. Thanks very much. So we're at the end of our time. Uh, you can see on your screen, um, I think momentarily here, our next webinar, which um, I just lost the view of, sorry. It's um, Red Cap, which is Friday, May 16th, next week. Uh, and then you can go to Genetic Alliance's webinar. You can even just Google Genetic Alliance webinar, or you can go back to where you registered uh, and see all the different tools that we will be presenting. We're happy to add more tools if people feel that there are some they would like to hear about. The tool creators, makers, presenters have been very generous with their time, as you've seen today by our three presenters. Um, and we want to thank, again, Carol, Kathy, and Wayne uh, for presenting to us. Uh, again, this is recorded and will be available to you shortly uh, in the next couple of uh, days or at least week, and we'll send an email out to all of you. So again, thank you to the presenters. My pleasure. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.